welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, so, Natalia from Wikimedia Poland and myself, Veronika from Wikimedia Germany, we are um, going to talk about volunteer support and more specifically um, about things that have to do with motivation um, in volunteer support. It's going to be a little bit of um, theory about motivation and then hopefully um, a nice discussion uh, because I think in every community we have, you know, at least at some point the question how can we motivate people, um, what helps with motivation, what should be avoided if we don't want to demotivate people and so that's going to be the main topic. Um, why motivation? Because it says volunteer support, what makes the difference? And um, actually, not long ago, I had a discussion about what it is actually that, um, well, what the impact of our work as volunteer supporters is. And um, somebody asked me, well, do you think if you didn't support the community, do you think they would stop volunteering for Wikimedia projects or would they stop writing articles? And, um, for example, if you don't provide them with literature, what you do as one thing. Um, and the answer is no, I don't think so. I think they would find a way to still write articles. Um, and obviously there's a lot of things that get done um, more efficiently or in, in some way, in a better way, if we support people. But we found that a lot of it comes down to motivation. It is one of our tasks to um, help people stay motivated with what they do. And that's why um, we picked this topic. Um, yeah, so um, motivation is basically what is needed for people to do something. Without motivation, people don't do anything. It's, um, yeah, it's the driving force, you can say. So, um, obviously, if we want to increase our community <coughs> size or um, if we want to keep the people in the projects, what they need in order to do that is motivation. Um, now, what is it? This is not a... Well, there are different definitions, obviously, of motivation, but one good way of describing it is that motivation is the totality of motives and influences um, which impact a decision or action. So if you look at it, um, you notice that there's a difference between motives and motivation. Um, motivation is made up out of motives, but also other influences on the situation. And that can literally be anything, like um, we'll say more about that later, but this is quite a good working definition um, for, for our purpose here. Um, actually, have to know. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> okay, so um, it's important to understand the difference between motives and motivation. Most people, when they talk, actually, they use the word synonymously. So when they mean motives, they say motivation most of the time. It's not necessarily a problem, but it's important to understand that um, motives are basically the driving force behind motivation, and they are very constant. Motives, you could almost compare them to values, I guess, because like values, they stay constant over longer periods of time. So if you have a certain motive for doing something when you're 20, it is very likely that you will still have the same motives 10 years later, 20 years later. It's not something that changes quickly. Um, motivation, on the other hand, is always dependent on the situation. So motivation is something that can quickly change. Um, that's the main difference between motivation and motives. Um, so... Yeah, nowadays um, motives and also motivation are usually categorized um, as intrinsic or extrinsic. 
Um, before there were differentiations used like altruistic and so on. That's not really um, the case in in psychology nowadays anymore. Usually it's intrinsic or extrinsic. Intrinsic meaning that the motivation or the motive comes from oneself. Um, and extrinsic meaning that it comes from um, some factors outside of the subject. Um, an example, for example, example, for example, um, an artist. An artist who likes to paint and paints pictures only because he or she really enjoys the process of painting. Um, that's an intrinsic motive for painting, just because the act of painting itself is something joyful for this person. Um, if you have another artist and he or she paints because um, he or she needs money and wants to sell the paintings, that's an extrinsic motive for painting. It's actually to, to receive something else, to receive a reward or some benefit this person paints. And um, with this example, it's also quite clear that there's never really um, a, a complete distinction between extrinsic and intrinsic motives. Usually, more than just one motive are combined when it's about motivation. And usually, you can have um, intrinsic aspects to a motive and extrinsic aspects. So, for example, this artist who um, paints pictures to sell them, he or she probably also does it because they enjoy painting. You know, otherwise they might just as well um, find another way of making money. So it's usually a combination of various things. Um, yeah, so um, intrinsic motivation is, you can't say the, the good kind of motivation or the bad kind of motivation. That doesn't make sense, but for long-term commitment, intrinsic motivation is very valuable because um, those motives don't go away. If you have extrinsic motives, if you do something just to receive an award or um, a reward um, or gain something from it, it is very likely that once you achieve that, your motive, well, you know, your motivation might change. So, um, the thing is that intrinsic motivation is very, very difficult to influence. And as volunteer supporters, I think, anyway, it shouldn't be our, our wish or our desire to influence people and like manipulate them. That's not something that we want to do. Um, but there are things we can, we can do to help um, when that motivation is already there to help uh, nourish it. Um, and one thing with <laughs> extrinsic motivators, we talked a lot about um, prizes already during this conference. I was in a couple of sessions where people talked about you know, prizes for either writing contests, photo contests, and so on. Um, those are typical extrinsic motivators. Um, you, you do something, well, let's put it the other way. You get a prize for doing something. Um, it doesn't have to be that the people who participate in a contest with a prize do it only because of the prize. If they did it only for the prize, it would be completely extrinsically motivated. They want to get the book voucher, so they participate. Um, for most, it will probably be a combination of various motives, like before. You know, most people really enjoy taking pictures during Wikilabs Earth, for example. And the fact that they can win something is also a bonus. But um, one problem now is just with extrinsic motivators that they can really have a negative effect. There are a couple of scientific studies um, because the whole field of motivation is quite well researched um, when it comes to motivation of employees. Um, that's a big field in, um, in management theory um, but also in psychology. And um, there are some very interesting studies that show if you um, if people have an intrinsic motivation, an intrinsic motive for doing something, and 
then you give them an extrinsic reward for something that they were already doing without anything before that, it can happen that they lose their intrinsic motivation. It's called the over-justification effect. And um, this is especially likely to happen if they really enjoy what they're doing anyway, if they've been doing it for a while without any reward, and if to them it doesn't feel like a special task, you know, if it's something that they would ordinarily do anyway. Um, it doesn't have to happen, but it can happen. That's why there's one um, guy, uh, Reinhard Sprenger, he says motivating kills motivation. Um, yeah, there's, um, with this intrinsic and extrinsic, it's, um, you never quite know what you get if you have external rewards. I think we, maybe we can discuss this later as well with the prizes, because I think many of us have um, experiences with giving people prizes for something, and in most cases it works fine. But, um, yeah, we'll have a, a few examples and discussions later on to see. Um, anyway, what is always, um, according to studies at least, always um, good for motivation is um, appreciation and praise. It is also a form of, um, of reward, if you want to call it like that. But um, it's nothing material, and it's not... Um, the reason for people doing a certain action and participating uh, in, a, in a contest but if you appreciate stuff like that and if you tell the volunteers it is very likely to have a positive effect on, um, on their motivation and we actually wrote some learning patterns as well about, um, about the topic of appreciation so um, I'll have the links in the slides later on Mm. Yeah, so th I, um, that basically sums up what I said about the motivators and um, what can happen if, with extrinsic motives. Okay, so now the question is, um, if it's so difficult to influence intrinsic motives and if extrinsic motivators can be so problematic, what choice do we actually have left? Um, and uh, we thought about that quite a lot. Uh, like when I first started learning about motivation and how it all works, I thought, okay, well, then basically there's nothing we can do, right? Um, but the key is, if we look at the um, definition again, because motivation is this current state caused by motives and by the situation. So if we have no, no real impact on the motives, we have to work on the situation to have an, uh, an effect on motivation. And um, that sounds very vague now, I'm aware, um, because the situation is literally everything. Um, so literally everything, you know your personal situation, your financial situation, your health, your job, everything that surrounds you in, in a particular situation where motivation is, uh, is uh, of interest. Um, but more specifically, when you volunteer for Wikimedia projects, um, it's also the situation directly relating to the Wikimedia context. So things like family, job, health, we will never be able um, to, to work on that part of the situation because it's out of our, of our scope. But what we can, for example, do is work on the volunteering situation and that can mean um, making it possible for volunteers to do what they do in such a way that for them they can easily combine it with their personal situation and are flexible enough for, you know, to have time for their family and, and job and so on. Um, okay, so more specifically, um, in volunteer support, what's the situation that we can change or that we can provide for volunteers in order 
to have a good effect on motivation. It's a lot of things. Um, you know, the, the activities, someone who wants to contribute. Um, for people who are already contributing, they will know that there are many things they can do. But um, for people who are not so aware, they think, okay, so I can write articles and I can take pictures. What else can I do? And there's so many more things. And the more you can offer to people in terms of what they can do to get involved and to help, the more likely it is that they will find something that really suits their expectations, their wishes. And the better the match is between what people would like to do and what they do, um, the more likely it is to have a positive effect. And the flexibility, that's what we already um, mentioned with the, um, you know, making it possible to have family and friends and do voluntary work. Um, also, participation is um, a key thing. That's also something that you will see if you, um, if you read about the, well, about motivation in management um, when it comes to motivation of, um, of employees. In those companies where employees um, have more possibilities to actually participate in decision-making processes, the motivation is higher, according to some studies. So, um, yeah, I think as Wikimedia organizations, we're, we're very, I mean, participation is how things work for us, but um, it can also mean, for example, that in your chapters or user groups, if you design a new program for supporting volunteers, say, you know, you want to introduce a rapid grant <coughs> or something similar, it might be a good idea to um, get the people concerned involved and actually talk to community before doing that. Then also low hurdles. So if participation, uh, well, if um, volunteering is too complicated, if it's too bureaucratic, if you have to fill out like pages of forms before you can get a grant, um, that will have a negative impact on the situation and thus a negative impact on, um, on the motivation. Um, also, if it's too expensive, for example, if you, if you, you know, keep, um, say, going to a university to teach students about um, Wikipedia and you don't get a refund for the train ticket and you go there every month and you end up spending a lot of money. For some people it might not be a problem, but at the moment where it becomes like a strain on the situation, that the financial situation is just too difficult, it will have a very negative effect on motivation. Um, and, you know, that's one of the factors. All of those, if, if one of those aspects don't work, it, is, it doesn't matter how, how well defined your motives are because, you know, a typical example would be if you, if you volunteer at an animal shelter, you always go there to walk dogs, um, you have this motive and you really like doing that, but say then you have to move to a different place, of, to a different apartment, and you can't just go there quickly anymore, it always takes you two hours to get there, and the train ticket is more expensive and so on, you will still really want to go there and walk the dogs. But it just becomes very difficult with the whole situation. It takes too much time, it costs too much, so eventually it will lead to you probably not doing it or not doing it so often anymore. Um, yeah, and all of the other things like availability of necessary tools, skills and information, that's something where we can do a lot for volunteers um, by you know, providing them with information or, or things that we need. There's so much information on Meta, um, you know, lots of great learning patterns. Everybody has um, valuable experiences to share. If we can help people, you know, find the right information, because often in the German community anyway, I notice that people don't really know that something has already been done and they don't know that there might already be a really good um, learning pattern about how to organize a great editor talk, for example. So they do it all over again, and also the skills, um, 
you could, for example, have workshops um, um, about a certain skill that is needed, like communication skills or press work and so on. What we have going on a lot at conferences like these. And yeah, well, all of those things. Now, um, the next slide, please don't, uh, don't get too confused. I know it looks a bit, um, it looks a bit complicated. It's basically just a summary of, um, of what I just said. So motivation is the combination of situation and motives. The motives here, the, um, those blue dots, um, I'm not saying that those are all the motives that there are for doing voluntary work. But there's something called the um, what's it called the volunteer function inventory. Um, it's quite interesting. That's why I put the link there. Um, from various studies combined, people came to the conclusion that those are the core motives for doing voluntary work. And actually, um, at a Wikimedia conference, I think two years ago. Um, we did a workshop about motives and asked people why do you volunteer, why do you do what you do and the results were very very similar um, so I also put the link to, the, um, to that session now in the outside circle you have the situation in, like on that corner it's the personal situation with lots of different things that are not on there and all of this here is the situation um, directly concerning the volunteering so that's what we can change um, and yeah so summing up basically if we work on the conditions and the framework surrounding voluntary work we can have a good impact on motivation and um, in the same sense obviously it is true that if this surrounding situation is not ideal, it can have a negative effect on motivation. Um, take for example the, um, where is it, um, the positive work environment, online and offline. That's actually, if you think about it, it makes total sense. If, if the work environment is not something that makes you feel welcome or at ease, you try to avoid that situation, and so eventually retreat. You wouldn't go to um, real life meetings if you knew that the situation there wouldn't be welcoming, and so on. Yeah, um, uh, do you have questions about this? I don't know, because I, I made this, this picture myself, and I'm not sure if it's so clear to people who are not me. <laughs> <laughs> That's just regarding the pictures. Yeah, and in general, motivation, the things, what I, what I said. Um, I have a question for discussion. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it's the right time now. Um, I think Maybe we'll the end. we'll go to the yeah um, we'll we'll go to the discussion now anyway. Um, yeah. <laughs> you have you have a couple of examples prepared, yeah. right? And we'll, yeah. I'll, I'll let you talk, I, and I look forward to drinking water. Yes, <clears throat> I don't know what your question is, so maybe it is a good time to, to ask it or save it to later and see if I'll relate to it uh, along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to discuss with you the border we, um, between paid and voluntary job, because we have a lot of contractors as a trainers, because it's, uh, I'm Gabriela, education manager from Czech Republic, so I'm an employee. Sometimes I feel a little bit strange that I'm doing some job, job like paid and people do same job but voluntary. But yeah, but the main focus of my question is um, where is where is the border? Because some people do some trainings like volunteers. Some people who train more and I mean I mean all often than the others. They are contractors and it's paid, so it's a little bit tricky because. I would like that it will be fair for everybody yeah. and how to set up some rules regarding this. If you have some experiences. 
I, I, I read about um, cases like that actually, and what they were suggesting in that article was that it should never be the case that volunteers and employees do exactly the same things. So there should always be a clear um, division of labor, if you want to call it like that. So, um, and clearly defined what the tasks of the employee are and um, what the tasks of the volunteer are. I mean, obviously you don't have a contract, but um, it can become very problematic, I think, if, um, if it's the case that people do the same thing and one gets paid and one doesn't and one has, you know, there's a lot of things influencing that then. Also, what about the, the responsibilities? If you're a staff member paid, um, there will be different expectations to you, probably. You will have more responsibilities in terms of documentation and um, I'm not saying that it's, I mean, if it's a volunteer doing something, maybe we're not so strict, you know, if someone is five minutes late, it's like, yeah, don't worry, you know what I'm saying, this, this type of thing. We had a similar uh, thing in Germany where um, we had a contractor for a project and then the project was done and she wasn't a contractor anymore. Um, but she continued doing what she did without getting paid for it. And even though she, you know, she did it on her own, I think it, it was a bit problematic actually mm -hmm. just for her and the feeling. Um, so, yeah, I think, well, I don't know, do you have experiences with that well, kind of... I think that this conference is a pretty good experience because we have our paid staff working on preparing mm -hmm. this conference and we have our volunteers. Uh, working at this conference, so when we were building the, the task list, we let the volunteers choose what they want to do, when they want to do it, and we are not that strict in controlling the time that they come, exactly as like Veronica said, and the paid staff was basically <laughs> made to do all the things which are, uh, which are more difficult, more demanding, and so on, so uh, we just wanted the volunteers to really do what they want, what is fun for them and uh, uh, appreciating them and making them feel that they can contribute to, to this conference in the way that they feel is fun for them. And we took all, uh, all the things that are not so fun, a little bit boring and a little bit hard on the paid staff. Also the paid staff need to be on time and so on and so on. So. Basically, this is what we usually do. We let the volunteers have the fun and the, the paid staff do the, the old things that are sometimes invisible but need to be done and are harder. Yeah. Taking the burden of volunteers. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's uh, ed education um, workshops that you give? or uh, There's a lo lot of... Mm -hmm. This kind of situation, mm -hmm. for example, lectures, trainings, it, it depends. So maybe mm -hmm. I don't want to take the space here, so maybe we can talk about it a yeah. little bit deeper yeah. later. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so mm -hmm. I would like to follow what Veronica said with a discussion which is uh, more based on very specific, specific examples, but uh, one thing I would like to clear up at the beginning is that we and Veronica are in a in this situation that we are paid staff for a big chapters who are people dedicated to do volunteer support, but the situations are different. There are chapters in which volunteer support is divided through volunteers and paid staff. There are user groups which don't have any paid staff, but they have those volunteers who are like the driving force behind this, this user group and they do a lot of work and they try more to engage more people so I would so I would think about volunteer supporters very very widely and uh, while I'll be giving some examples I would really like to have your feedback because maybe you will feel that the examples I'm giving are not related to the situation of your organization and you have a very different perspective and maybe I'm in a totally wrong place for making this relevant for you so 
uh, please speak up and show your perspective so that we can see how supporting volunteers work in different affiliates and in different roles. And um, the first thing I would like to start with is I would like to brag a bit because I received a micro grant a few days before, uh, and this is the first time for a long for a long time I ended up on, on the other end of the volunteer support because I received support. I can do it because I'm not giving away grants. This is not my responsibility. We have a committee of volunteers. And I didn't know how motivating this is. It was super fun. Uh, when I received my micro grant, it was a book which I received on my Kindle <coughs> very fast. The next day I woke up an hour earlier just to write an article. Already I was so eager to write an article. And I have a small child, so I'm sleep deprived, so like an hour of my sleep is the, is the most valuable thing I have, right? So, and I got this micro grant because it was super easy. Because I was writing articles about women movie pioneers. This is like my thing. Uh, and I found that there is a book, a great source, and I didn't have access to it, and I was frustrated because I really wanted to use it. And I knew that I can receive, uh, that I can apply for a micro grant, and I did it right away. Writing the application took me 10 minutes, and the decision process took 72 hours because this is how our micro grants program work. They, uh, they are by, based on a very simple <coughs> applications. You just writing, I want to write this and that, and I need this, and this is how much it costs, and this is the link to the online shop. Uh, thank you very much, I'll do it in like 12 months, a month, three months. And the committee <clears throat> decides on it very, very quickly. So it is super easy. And I think that there is, when we support our volunteers, there's always this tension between trust, because if they gave me this uh, grant so easily, what, what, uh, how do they know that I will fulfill it? And there is bureaucracy. So we always have to choose between trust and bureaucracy, which, of course, if you a very detailed uh, application with dates and a specific list of articles, is giving us a lot more confidence uh, in the fact that the volunteer is going to fulfill what they said they will. Uh, but at the same time, it's more difficult. And I don't know if I would apply for this grant, if I would have to like spend an hour on you know, research what is in this book, what do I need, and so on. So, uh, there is always this question, we should make things easy. But how easy should it be? Where, where are the boundaries? Do you, like, do you have any, or maybe you have programs when you <coughs> rent equipment to volunteers. The, does any of your communities have micro grants program? Yes. Yeah, so, how do you do it? Do you? How easy is it in your community? You copy it from your rules. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice rules, right? <laughs> For Estonia, it, it has just been uh, a committee of uh, two appointed members for general assembly, and and then they they follow their best intuition because they generally don't have any micro grants. But you have program, but it's not too involved in it, so there is no strict policy. But there is a committee who is trusted uh, by the, or, or mandated by the General Assembly of uh, Czech Okay, and do people like, how do people apply for this, for this micro grants? The, the different models have been uh, tried because uh, the participation level is low. So we have had uh, certain time frames, windows where you can apply for. And uh, we've, uh, we've also had a version where the window is open like throughout the year, and then you can you can apply for so. And then you have to uh, send an application uh, to the committee, which consists of a general outline of uh, of the thing you want to do and the reasoning why you want to do it. Yeah, but it's it's free format. Okay, so it's not very complicated. It's, it's, it's very, it's very easy process, <coughs> uh, and it has been designed that way because we have low participation on, on micro grants. People are not, uh, not taking part, mm -hmm. and uh, we have intentionally tried to make a low uh, threshold uh, mm -hmm. way to do that. Uh, but, uh, but still, we lack participation. We don't have people stepping up. It's it's interesting because um, 
you know, if you have a really easy process for something, that's great. But um, if people don't know about it, or if they don't use it for other reasons, what do you do with it? We actually, um, yeah, we would like to make our um, our volunteer spot in Wikimedia in Germany. We would like to make it more visible and have more people use it, because the German community is really big, and I mean we we um, do get lots of requests for grants and so on, but compared to the overall size of active editors, could be more people, and um, yeah, that's why it also says communicate an easy accessible framework with possibilities. I think that's where we in Germany, um, we still, what we do, we have like a portal on Wikipedia together with Wikimedia Austria and Wikimedia Switzerland, because we share the same language community. And um, everything is explained in detail, how to do things, and um, there will be an English translation soon so that people can have a look at it. It will be on MetaLand. Um, but the problem is that we don't communicate it well enough. The people who know it, like our core community, they know about it, so they know where to go and where to find the information. But those who don't know it yet won't discover it by chance. So that's where we still have to work. But yeah, I don't know if in Estonia um, do people know that they have this possibility and just don't use it? Or? <coughs> to tell people to communicate to, uh, to the community and in several terms it also like the setting up the community's decision of general assembly. Like, so this chapter member does know, but it's also we don't have such a big community. Mm -hmm. like 30 people and it has been communicated on several occasions. Uh, also, the one thing is that uh, you don't use microgrant system in Estonia to <coughs> reimburse uh, transportation and such things. So uh, it, it's also this might be part of the issue. And also, as the active off wiki community is uh, uh, related to chapter activities, also they they m might get funds in in other ways. So these are these are some of the, the things that might be hindering. Uh, the participation by others and also maybe with the other people who we actually want to involve with the microgrants. Maybe they are feeling that the chapter people are dealing with stuff anyway and mm. we can just edit that. It doesn't matter. <coughs> so yeah, there, are, there are many aspects to it. Well, <coughs> if I could add on communication, we have a newsletter in Polish Wikipedia. It's a weekly newsletter. Uh, I write it. It's one of the favorite things I do because I try to keep it fun. Sometimes, in <laughs> sometimes only fun for me, but still. <laughs> so I try to keep it fun, and I give like the weekly information about what happened in our chapter, and I always inform people what grants, what micro grants have been given throughout the week, so that people constantly have in the back of their minds that oh, someone got a book to write about lakes. So, so if they would need something, they would like. Pop up. Oh, I can have a micro grant. So maybe this is like we, we do have a weekly newsletter, and uh, also the micro grants is uh, has has been mentioned there. But it's hard to uh, tell stories about micro grants if you are not giving out any micro grants. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I sometimes write Polish stories. Actually, I, <laughs> no, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, actually, I sometimes write in the newsletter. Hey, why did anyone take a micro grant this week? Yeah. I do write it. Yeah, then that's good. <laughs> and then also showing what has been done with microgrants, also mm. things that has been have been done in our countries. It's, it's a good way to start. Things. <coughs> mm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, th this week's article is written with books from microgrants, something like that. Yeah. yeah. We also have problem. Uh, the community in Ukraine is not so big, but our people are like you know, newbies come. Uh, old people, like experienced users, uh, stop editing. And you find yourself that you should always somehow uh, mention to new people because uh, experienced users already forgot about it, it was last year, and uh, newbies just don't know about it, and you should always mention it, have to mention it. Like, like, just writing that village font somehow doesn't, yeah. so it isn't really effective. So usually what we do, we actually, if we hear somebody mentioning that he would do something, if we could go somewhere or find a book, we would go to him and go to her and write, uh, you can apply, you know. <laughs> like, so we're vigilant. Yeah, we only write. We tried for some things, we tried, um, 
in German Wikipedia there's like portals on different topics. And um, so we just posted on the discussion or talk pages um, of those portals. You know, for example, okay, you want to write about bio or you write about biology, um, you can get books from us or access to um, databases and so on. And that works a little bit better than writing it in the village pump. Um, because it's, exactly, and people feel more like approached directly, and not like you're just yelling something out for the general public. But you know, they feel it's tailored to them. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone has some question or think so? <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> the other thing is that we try to find ways to support volunteers, but in order to support our volunteers correctly, we need to know what they want. And we are pretty good at communicating to our volunteers, but we still need to look for ways to listen. Uh, one of the things I do in Wikimedia Poland is that I try to talk to as much community members as I can during, during our conferences. Sometimes I write emails to ask, well, how are you doing? And I I write everything I hear down because sometimes people tell me things which I don't find relevant but when I write it down and I see there's some <clears throat> needs and questions and expectations that are not that big but th they are common throughout the community I start finding solutions and things I can do. Also we do some surveys between the community but the I like service because they always give me this feeling that now I found out something, but there are very closed form and you don't can, cannot find everything throughout the survey. So I don't know, what are your ways to communicate with your community in, in the way that they can give you feedback about what you are doing in your, in your user groups and your chapters? Do you have some system? Do you have a way? In ah. Germany, for example, um we have a new thing now, um, well, not so new anymore, we started it at the beginning of the year, but it still feels like, yeah, it doesn't feel like September yet. Um, it, and it's because when we have a project, when we support something, um, we don't use microgrants, so for, for us it's all the same. We all call it projects, no matter whether it's a book or whether it's sending camera equipment or whether it's a complete photo um, expedition with ten people. It's all in a in a in a list. Um, like we enter everything into a form, and then it's in a list. And actually, with like Excel, you can make great. Not I can't, but my colleagues can make great things, so that they can automatically send emails from that list. And um, so, what we do now, we have a very short email after someone has received report, uh, sorry, support, um, with like three short questions. Um, were, you, um, were you happy with the support? Was the support useful for you? And um, what can we improve? Do you want to tell us anything? Um, and always like the first two questions are on a scale from zero to ten and so on. And People don't have to reply, but some people do, and we get a lot of interesting things in the what can we improve, and um, do you want to tell us something? In the beginning I thought, well, what, what could they possibly tell us that they haven't already told us or that they wouldn't tell us otherwise? But actually, you know, it's very small things. Um, one, one comment once was, um, actually, when you refund me money, um, it would be so much more useful if on my bank account statement it had refund or something. I'm like, yeah, that's a very easy thing. We can do that. Um, <laughs> we just didn't know that that was an issue. Um, so it's, yeah, that's been um, quite useful. And it doesn't, um, I thought it might annoy the community members to always get those emails. But so far, um, most people seem pretty okay with it. Um. 
Okay, I think this one is <clears throat> kind of important, and I expect that you had some situations like that in, in the past, because um, <clears throat> even if you have a very motivated volunteer who is doing a project, something might change, and the motivation of that person may change. It may be for good reason. Maybe this uh, person, I don't know, changed their uh, family situation. They had a child. Maybe they fell in love. I don't, don't have so much time to Wikipedia. Maybe they changed their job. Or maybe they got in a conflict during the organizing this, this uh, project. Maybe they got demotivated because something bad happened and they lied. Those are things that we usually cannot predict and cannot work on them. But there is this. But this person started a project, and suddenly, they are not motivated anymore. We had the situation that we had a photographer who went for an expedition, and he was very excited about his expedition, and made many pictures. And then the person came back, and suddenly, didn't really want to upload pictures to comments, and was very demotivated. And we didn't know why. Probably something happened in, in his life, and it was very difficult to us because we needed those pictures. So uh, those situations happen. And uh, do you have such uh, experience that? The, yeah, so do you have any solution, advice, good practices, horror stories? <laughs> horror stories. <laughs> For example, um, we have system that if we uh, refund some costs. The condition is to upload pictures, to um, give us bills and so on, and after we refund the costs. So it's yeah. like, a, and it, it works. Yeah, this is the external motivation, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we also do it like this. I mean, in Ukraine, <coughs> when you go somewhere, you should, um, you should upload pictures, you should do the stuff that you promised to do, but sometimes they also give money beforehand, like uh, some amount of money. And uh, we sometimes also want the material that they had. So we, we had a guy who, I believe it was a guy, who couldn't post information, uh, didn't want to upload pictures, and we asked him to give us those pictures. We would upload ourselves and then OTRS permission. So for him, it was like, you know, giving us a shared link to his uh, uh, Google Drive with pictures and one email that we prepared. We really prepared everything. We prepared the text, we prepared everything. Um, and uh, OTRS uh, requires now that you should upload pictures first and send them the OTRS with uh, uh, links to the pictures already uploaded that say that OTRS permission is uh, pending. So we did everything and uh, all required like, all we wanted from here was not one, was one with the rest permission. Yes. But, what, for example, but what if it doesn't have anything to do with reimbursement of costs or something? Say, for example, um, you're, um, you're helping a volunteer organize a particular event, let's say an editathon, and um, with 25 people, a lot of preparation necessary. Um, a lot of work that needs to be done beforehand and now if, if that surrounding situation changes if the, you know, the motive of this person is probably still the same for wanting to do it but say the situation changes let it be the personal situation um, sickness in the family is something and all of a sudden in the middle of the preparations he or she can't continue or can't continue um, with the same amount of dedication what do you do in those cases? If we already announced it as our project, yes. we are going to carry it on. Like, because it's already our project. Yeah, it's probably easy for <coughs> chapters who have paid staff become, because they can <coughs> make the paid staff to take over, but what if it's a user group which relies only on volunteers? That's like... It depends. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I would say that uh, this should be solved in the planning of the process, uh, planning phase of the project by making some room for uh, unexpected okay, uh, occasions and if that can occur uh, we can uh, 
uh, we have, for example, this volunteer you know, who is working on this project, but can <coughs> be part of this project too, and just be more filled and part of planning as one of one part of the solution. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Does anyone want to comment on that? It yeah. can be hard. <laughs> <laughs> Carol, yeah. you wanted to say something? Uh, did you want to say something? I don't know. I, did I see your hand? Or? No, it was probably leaning my hand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a third day of conference, sorry. Yeah, so yeah. What, uh, <laughs> that's the thing that links to it. Um, but I could, we have like I, I could say, actually, uh, to follow up on, on what has been said, that these external motivators that have, we have spoken about, uh, they actually may, may be one of the reasons why people don't want to participate oh, I only get the money afterwards, I still have to pay myself anyway, it's so much hustle, it's, uh, I don't want to do that. And, and this is also what we can see actually with the conferences. So people, for example, in Australia, maybe some people don't want to apply for a grant for going to some conference because we have to write a blog post afterwards. So mm. I, I don't really want to do that. But this is also part why we send people to conferences so they can share back. So, but, but it's uh, these external, mo so to say, external motivators and the fun reporting you have to do afterwards. Not all of the people in our communities perceive reporting as fun. We we have a lot of discussions um, with our, or we had a lot of discussions with our communities in uh, the German-speaking countries, um, and I think now we've reached kind of like a good solution because we try to. Well, we try to be very flexible when it comes to what we expect from people afterwards. There's no set format that says, okay, afterwards you have to fill in this page with your documentation and so on. So what we do for every project <coughs> beforehand, we decide with the person um, what should the results look like, what should the documentation be like. And it actually helps people understand why we need what we need and why we ask them for what we ask them for and all of a sudden it becomes less oh I have to write a report no it's you want to share what you learned with the rest of the community how else could they benefit from it as well and that does help a lot of people and if it's still an issue we also offer like other things we try to be flexible you know maybe we just have a, an hour of phone conversation with someone taking notes and with those notes, we write something ourselves. It's not ideal, but for some people, it can be a real, um, a real hurdle, um, and keep them from doing cool projects because they know, oh, I'm not the report kind of guy, and it's it's literally too stressful for them. So, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't. <laughs> so what we also try to do is that we, if we are having a bigger project. We try to have <coughs> people, um, we, we want the, the whole process to be known by others people, other people through all the steps because if the volunteer will be demotivated because something happens, people can easily step up and do it because they already have the information, they know how the process is going and they are pretty prepared and this is not like the panic mode because the someone who is preparing, I don't know, a conference, a glam project that someone disappears and and you need to find out what was done, what was the communication with the partners and so on. Uh, if we are all aware how the process is going, it is very easy to, to step in and, and take it further. This is like the only thing that we came up with. <coughs> Also, we try to have good relations with our volunteers and uh, know what is going on in their lives and maybe you know, know when they are being overwhelmed and they don't want to say it, that I can do it anymore because I found a new job and this is too difficult to, for me. And uh, So we like to know when to step in and say, hey, maybe you need some help, maybe you can take something, something away from you. Ah, the favorite part, the, the appreciation. Uh, yeah, so there are, um, there are those learning patterns on Meta that we wrote a while ago. Um, I just wanted to put it in there again because um, I mentioned this study um, that praise and appreciation basically always has a positive impact, uh, positive effect 
um, on motivation. Um, so if you know if you're if you want to be careful with extrinsic motivators, that's uh, fair enough. But there's also ways of um, using praise as a motivator um, that will not lead to this, you know, over justification effect. The extrinsic motivators killing the motivation, basically. Um, yeah, and appreciation. I mean, it's little things like, for example, um, I like what you said. We like to know what goes on in our volunteers' lives. Um, it's often just things like asking people how they are doing and meaning it, of course, you know, and showing genuine interest in the people you work with and um, trying to understand their situation, learn about their expectations and needs, as you said. Um, it's, but, you know, also things like um, for all of us in Wikipedia, using the thank you button. It's scientifically proven that not the thank you button, I don't know if there's studies about that yet, but that this kind of praise or appreciation for someone's um, actions is an incredible motivator. And um, yeah, there are lots of good studies about that. If you're interested in that, I can. Uh, there was actually some study about the thank you, thank you button on uh, Wikis. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. I think Asaf mentioned it, and uh, it uh, should increase the several percent I'm about the numbers, okay. but it's research and uh, it has positive impact. Okay. Yeah, uh, if, yes, cool. <laughs> I wanted to comment on your um, statement that it, it's virtually always uh, useful to, to provide appreciation and praise. Um, I would, I would uh, highlight an exception to that. Uh, mm -hmm. It is usually very good to provide appreciation and praise, and good uh, leaders and good uh, community builders are generous with their appreciation and with sharing credit for their work. <clears throat> the one case where it might actually be a net loss to provide uh, public appreciation is if you are appreciating the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So if you, for example, develop uh, Kind of an automatic knee-jerk appreciation every time someone mentions they've done anything without looking into it, you may end up appreciating someone who did an activity, but the activity turns out to, for example, have been entirely copyright violations. Wikipedians tend to notice that kind of thing, and if you are seen to be praising the guy who essentially just plagiarized material into Wikipedia, you are seen to be uh, an uncritical appraiser, and that debases yeah. the value of your coin of appreciation. Yeah, very good point. Um, you, so, some minimal level of, of uh, uh, I don't know, control for what is it that you are praising. Just, just take a look and see that it does look like bona fide activity mm -hmm. uh, is, is useful. Yeah, and also, um, now that you mention it, it has the, we were talking about this before, um, that um, external motivators or extrinsic motivators um, almost always have a bad effect on motivation if it's for something that people would ordinarily be doing anyway and if it's nothing that is perceived as special by them. So I think the same can also be said for praise. You know, if it's something they don't even know, okay, that was not so special, why are you like all enthusiastic about it? That's probably the same effect, yeah. Okay, so I'm getting communication from the room downstairs that I yeah. want to have the C <coughs> future session. Uh, yeah, and they're uh, waiting, they're actually kind enough to wait for us, so uh, if there's something else you would like to add and you would like to uh, to point out, we have like two more minutes and then we will... And we still need to um, um, talk about our great Facebook group. Yeah, people to join us on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, because we like to, you know, move the discussion um, to, well, not that we wanted to move it to Facebook, but we like to keep the discussion going and Facebook has proven a good way of doing that. I know that some of you are already in our Facebook group. Um, 
please everybody who is interested in volunteer support and interested in exchanging ideas and uh, you know experiences, um, do join the Facebook group, please. We'd be happy to keep in touch. Yeah, know what <coughs> what you are doing, and maybe we can sometimes find solutions. Yeah. We are also planning on um, on meeting for the first time, like as volunteer supporters. You know, there's glam meetups um, or meetings, there's education meetings, and we just thought it's about time to have that for volunteer support and um, find a way to, well, you know, to really get the the exchange of experiences and ideas and supporting each other um, get it going. Yeah. yeah, thank you for your attention and uh, your, your discussions. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. See you on Thursday.